always glad to be among the saints and to have opportunity to worship and uh, to grow together. I appreciate the comments and questions of everyone in class. Thank you. And uh, we're going to talk still about the assignment I have been given by the men here to discuss what it takes to qualify elders, uh, which is a good thing to look for and a good thing to seek out in any congregation. That is good. I want to preface this uh, today with the thought that, you know, this should be uplifting, <laughs> and um, I'm hopeful that you'll find it to be so. It's intended to be so, and uh, let's just get started. I'm going to take a bit of a different approach, as is, I guess, my normal way of doing things. What can you say? I don't think normal like other people. <laughs> so it's always a little bit different, but think about it this way with me, if you will. The question is, are you elder material? Because we're talking about what are the qualities that we seek or that we desire? What is it that makes somebody a person who can serve as an elder? But the subtitle here is, you better be. Well, the reason for that is that once you get to looking at it, you come to realize that Actually, the meaning of these passages is uh, that he is a faithful Christian. He is a Christian husband. He is a Christian father. That's the meaning. And uh, I want us to go through it together. But the usefulness of this is to realize that you do know what these things are and what they mean. You know, it's, it's not a, um, a black box. It's not a, a something that is a mystery or that is uh, beyond us, too hard to understand. That's not the nature of God's word. It never, it never is. And uh, I don't accept that in any other subject. So I don't accept that in this subject either. And I, I don't think you should. Um, fairly simply, the point of 1 Timothy 3 <coughs> And the point of Titus 1, where they talk about how you choose these men, is that they meet these qualities, which are qualities that are, again, faith, the faith. A faithful Christian, a faithful husband, a faithful father. For the most part, that is the case. Now, there may be a bit more to it, which we'll get to. And I'll say, too, uh, this is you know just a very high-level fairly simple look at what it takes, by all means, um, submit to me, I guess, since I'm teaching, um, <laughs> the questions that you have about specifics when it comes to elders and their qualities and their appointment and whatever else. What the men asked me to do was to teach about this uh, topic for a month with the intent that at the end of the month we might be able to solicit nominations which is to say you look among you at the fathers and husbands that are part of this congregation and put forward the name or names of any individuals that you see who can serve in this capacity. So if you have any questions about that um, or the process, uh, questions about what it takes to be an elder or the process, please submit them uh, to me so that I will have time to put those together into a question and answer lesson, um, you know, before we get to nominations, which is probably before the end of this month, or it might be the middle of next month. I'm not sure because of the, the gospel meeting schedule, etc. cetera. But um, in short order, if you will. But yeah, basically the idea here is we look at this as what it's really getting at. These are supposed to be good, faithful brothers who are doing what they're supposed to be doing in their station in life. That's the real meaning, the big picture. Yes, there are more, there's more to it. There's more details. I understand that. Don't worry about that. I get it. It will get there. Um, but what I wanted to do was to take these words kind of one at a time in the order at which they appear in 1 Timothy and to let you see where these words or 
in the case where they don't occur anywhere else, there are some unique ones. See where related words, words that are, uh, you know, made of the same root or maybe are the verb form of the noun or vice versa, to let you see where those happen, where they happen in the rest of the Bible so that you can get a biblical definition in your mind. And, like I say, what I'm hoping is you will find and, and that you will agree that, oh yeah, yeah, I know what that means. <laughs> that's the whole, to me, that's encouraging. I hope that that's encouraging to you. So, above reproach is one of the first things that an elder must be in 1 Timothy 3 at verse 2. What is ab above reproach? What is a reproach? Well, actually, the word appears only in this letter to Timothy. It appears only in 1 Timothy 3, 2 about the elder, but it, um, and also in 1 Timothy chapter 5. So, we're going to go to 1 Timothy 5 to look at how the term is used there and allow it to define this for us. All right, so beginning at verse 3, honor widows who are truly widows. And by honor, he means financial support. They're going to uh, fulfill the pattern that we read about in Acts chapter 6, where if they have widows among them who are in need of care, daily care. They need food, they need supplies, they need to be visited, whatever that might be. And they're genuinely in need, they're on their own. Well, then the church literally enrolls them. It's the responsibility of the church to take care of them. So that's what he's talking about here is governing that relationship or who is to be given that support, that honor. Honor widows who are truly widows, but... If a widow has children or grandchildren, let the children first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. This is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, that they may be without reproach. That's your word, reproach. And if anyone does not provide for his relatives, that is to say his family members, in particular we're obviously talking about these widows, but I think it's generally true, especially members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. All right, well again... We're talking about the support of the widows at verse 3. We're taking them into the role. But if the widow has family members who can care for her, then those family members should take care of her. That's the point. That's the rule. The reproach that he says, you know, uh, command these things at verse 7, that they may be without reproach. Well, what is the reproach then? at verse 4. The, pro the reproach is if she is not actually in need. She has family who can care for her. Well then, the family should care for her, not the church. If she is not actually in need, then, you know, well then, what is she? Well, then, she is self-indulgent and dead while she lives taking the money, the supplies, the support from the church as a source of income when it rightly should come from her own family. That would be self-indulgent. It would be selfish. That is a reproach. On the other hand, it might be the case that there is a reproach if the children will not make a return to their parents. If the family of a, a needy widow decides we are not going to support her, let the church handle it. We are not going to do it. Well, that is a thing also that is condemned at verse 8. If you don't provide for your own, you have denied the faith and are worse than an unbeliever. So that's not an option. That is a reproach. 
And that reproach, therefore, is this kind of selfishness. Because they're both taking from the church by their actions. Whether that's the widow, who doesn't actually have a need, but she's just supplementing the income with this charitable support, or whether that's the family who could provide for their mom, but refuse to do so, they're also taking money from the church, if you will, because it's money that they should be supplying, that they should be providing to that widow, and they're not doing it, which leaves her desolate, which leaves her under the church's care, and we don't begrudge that as the church. We don't begrudge her at all. That's our responsibility. We'll step in there. Sure. But it is a reproach if a household acts that way. It is a reproach if somebody is taking selfishly. Right? Thinking about themselves, not thinking about others. That is the reproach. So when we say that the elder is to be without reproach, we mean he takes care of his own family. He doesn't act selfishly. He's not on the take. He doesn't shirk his responsibility and cause that to fall to general public charitable assistance. And, as I say, isn't this something you already know? <laughs> well, yeah. I think it is. That's my point. Is Well, yeah, you know that that's not the right way to act. That would be immoral. Dear old mom is at home. Dad has been gone for years. Mom never worked outside the house or whatever. Is now herself an invalid and cannot work or whatever it is. How dare you not support her? <laughs> you couldn't possibly do that. And if that happens and we find out that you're not doing it, we'll withdraw from you. That's sinful behavior. Because we're the people of God and that's not what we're like and that's not what we do, right? Clearly. Which is how I'm asking the question, can any Christian be anything other than above reproach? What Christian has that first right of refusal <laughs> to say, well, we're not going to support her. I'm not going to support her. Let the church do it. Nobody has that right. Or to say, well, I'm going to take when I don't actually need. Or this responsibility that is rightfully mine, I'm going to push off to somebody else. I would outsource that. No, no Christian can do that, right? As we said, you already know this. You already know that you don't behave yourself that way. So, yeah, no elder behaves that way either. This is the meaning. All right, so let's get into a groove here. This is how it's going to work. We're going to take every term one at a time. We're going to look at the other verses. And we're going to start moving faster. <laughs> First Timothy 3, 2, husband of one wife. This is a word that appears, it's, a, it's only one word actually, husband of one wife is all one word actually in Greek. And it, it appears only in 1 Timothy. It's used here and in chapter 5 as well. But, uh, or it, well, actually that's not true. This appears in other places. I had the wrong note there. But really, all that this word means is monogamous. The fact is, it's just a wordy translation. <laughs> the word is literally one woman man. It's all one word. He's a one woman man. Um, what does that mean? It means he's monogamous. Monogamy. And why would you have to say that? Because monogamy was not something you could just assume in the ancient Mediterranean. The ancient Greeks practiced polygamy very normally. And in the modern Mediterranean, there are certainly cultures there that practice polygamy. There are cultures in, in uh, the Near East, and, and there might even be some in certain states of the United States that practice polygamy. But the fact that society does this and is okay with this, uh, makes this normal or normalizes this practice of polygamy or other kinds of gamy, <laughs> uh, doesn't make it right in God's eyes. Monogamy is what is required. The other thing that we should say about this is here in this example of one woman man you do have a requirement of an elder that isn't necessarily a requirement for everybody in one sense which is he does have to be married. <laughs> he does have to be a husband. 
that's required of an elder. You know, you as a Christian, in order to go to heaven, you don't have to get married. Right? You, you could live a celibate life and go to heaven. That is acceptable, certainly, in God's eyes. So in that sense, he's required to do something that you are not required. You don't have to get married. However, you know, let it be said, if you do get married, it has to be monogamous. <laughs> it isn't the case that it's like, hey, man, how come you got those three wives there? What's with the celestial wife thing? He's like, oh, it's cool. I'm not trying to be an elder. Oh, okay, then. Can you lead singing today? Right? <clears throat> Wrong. No. Obviously, no. You don't accept that. It's, it's okay if you're not married. You can be single and celibate and live right with God, and yeah, you can lead singing, of course. But if you are married, you have to be monogamous. You can't be anything other than monogamous and married. If we have a member of the church who has multiple wives or multiple husbands, polyandry, or multiple whatever that polyamory thing is that they talk about, uh, I heard about in Hawaii people ma marrying their houses or their pets and things. I mean, the world has got all kinds of gammy out there, as we say, things that it calls marriage that are not actually marriage as defined by the one who created it, God, when he created it in the garden, one man for one woman for life. Only monogamy is acceptable in the church. You cannot be a faithful Christian and have multiple spouses, right? So this is another one where you know what this means. Yes, you do know. We are supposed to be faithful. We're supposed to have this vow and keep this vow. Sober-minded, 1 Timothy 3.2. This is a term that gets used in these qualifications here in 1 Timothy 3, but it also gets used in Titus 2 where it's not actually qualifications it's just what accords with sound doctrine from Titus. I'm sorry, I said First Timothy. Didn't I? From Titus chapter two, Titus, Titus chapter two, verse one talks about teach what accords with sound doctrine. And there's something for the older men and for the older women, for the younger women and the younger men. There's it goes down the list. In the list of what is sound teaching, Titus two two, older men to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love and in steadfastness. So this is applied to the older generation in general. Not just to men who want to be elders, but to the older generation. And yet, would you really support the idea that only older men are to be sober-minded? Can you be unsound in faith? Uh, you know, as a Christian, can you behave yourself in an undignified way? Can you be not steadfast in faith, in love, in purity? As a Christian, you're not known for being steadfast in the faith, in purity, in hope, in love? No, nobody can do any of those things. It's not super and above what we're called to. Okay, So you know what that is, too, is the point. Again, the point is, you know what that is. Sober-minded means he's thinking clearly. He's sound in the faith. He's walking in a dignified way. He's not subject to the norms and mores of, of uh, culture or of society or of the times. He's walking according to the book. He's steadfast in the faith. And every Christian is supposed to be those things. That's the point. You're all supposed to be like that. We all are. Self-controlled is another thing that happens there, 1 Timothy 3, 2. And again, um, it occurs here. It also occurs in Titus 2. But self-controlled occurs for multiple classes of persons in Titus 2. As we said before, the first verse introduces the idea that there is a teaching that is in accord with the sound doctrine. We'll get the sound doctrine in a minute, but it means the teaching that is healthful, that is good for you, that promotes good spiritual health. Okay, But again, this applies to the population generally. In verse 2, the older men are self-controlled. 
In verse 3, the older women are likewise, in the same way as sober-minded, um, dignified, self-controlled. The same way the women are reverent, not slanderers, not slaves to wine, teaching what is good, and in this manner training the young women to do these things, as well as to love their husbands and children, and Ding, 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 to be self-controlled, yes, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to the husband, that the word of God may not be reviled. And likewise, verse 6, the younger men should be self-controlled too. There's not a class of persons who are allowed to do something other than self-control. Is any Christian allowed to be unsound in the doctrine, to teach unsound faith, to be somebody who is not reverent, in their behavior, to be a slanderer, uh, impure, lacking self-control, out of control, getting wild out there. There's no Christian who's allowed to do that, right? You know that that's not a Christian life. That's no way to live as a Christian and to be known. So is anybody allowed to be something that is not self-controlled? If somebody is living this way, somebody is teaching unsound doctrine, Somebody is living impure, they're out of control, they're, they're out there in the world, they're, you know, you're seeing this show up in your, in your Facebook feed or whatever. You say, whoa, what is that? What are you doing? <laughs> That's not good for any Christian. That shouldn't stand for any Christian. I hope that if you find me on a Facebook feed, um, you know, partying it, partying it down over there at South Padre Island, you know, with my shirt off and a drink in my hand, that you will actually stop and say something about that. Don't just let that go unchecked. All right? Stand up to me in the faith, please, so that I can be saved in the last day. Right? Can anybody do that? No, nobody can do that. You know what this means. You see the pattern of life that that is, that is meant by self-controlled. First Timothy also calls on an elder to be respectable. And this is a word that actually only occurs here, but, but um, in First Timothy, but we can see what it means from the second chapter where it is used, where he speaks there. He's talking about respectable for the women, but in particular, respectable is talking about their clothing, and, and but not the clothing, though. It's talking about the attitude that goes into your selection of clothing. Respectable is an attitude, an approach, a philosophy to how you do things. Likewise, as the, the, the older men are to be sound, so also the women should adorn themselves, 1 Timothy 2.9, in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair, gold, pearls, costly attire, but with, but rather with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. What he means by that is not that you are forbidden from having jewelry, but rather that that's not who you are. That's not what shows who you are. It isn't about flash, pizzazz, uh, you know, signs of your status in society. It is rather about what is proper for those who profess godliness. It's about the good works. So we're talking about distraction. Don't let your clothing distract from your character. How about that? But what is proper for those that profess godliness? That's what is respectable. So the, the woman wears, in, in 1 Timothy 2, the woman is, we're, we're focusing on the attire because it's a good, uh, indicator it's a good test if you will of where the attitude is so also with the elder if he is to be respectable well then he is not wearing disrespectful attire or apparel right he's not going to be going out into this world robed in pride and immodesty He's also going to be self-controlled, right? You, you, you can't be somebody who lives or dresses or walks or behaves in the world in such a way that nobody knows what you stand for or that you stand for God out of control. That's not respectable. I think of the story that Tom Roberts told me 
it, uh, somebody he had known who went to one of these kind of beach fire parties <coughs> way back when kids went to the beach party. <laughs> and I think they maybe heard surfer dude music too. I'm not sure. It was a long time ago. But uh, he said, you know, this, this guy's dancing around the fire, found this girl, looked really good in a bikini, you know, started to look better the more that you drink, that kind of thing. And starts talking to her saying, you know, hey, do you go to church anywhere, you know, thinking I'm going to get this one to obey. And she said to him, no, you think I'd be here? <laughs> Hospitable. First Timothy 3, 2, the elder is to be hospitable. Um, what is it to be hospitable? This is a good lesson in and of itself. But for now, let's allow the text to define its terms. Hospitable. Well, it only occurs here with these elder qualifications and also in one other place, First Peter. In First Peter, this term, hospitable, is a part of a larger attitude of service that applies to every member of the church. And you can see that as you read the passage, 1 Peter 4, beginning at verse 7. He said, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And if you haven't noticed yet, you're seeing a lot of the same terms pop up in these lists. And there's a reason for that. It's because all these things kind of fit together. It's the Christian life. It's faithfulness. Above all, verse 8, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And, verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. By which he means everybody has different opportunities or different uh, abilities, different uh, things that are available to them that they can use to serve one another. That's all he means. As each has received a gift, use it as good stewards of God's varied gifts or grace. Just saying, you have something that you can share or that you can do, some skill or talent you have, or maybe God has given you money, or maybe God has given you authority that you can use for the good of the saints, whatever it is. Or you're good at talking to people, or you found yourself in the same uh, uh, situation before as somebody else who is struggling, whatever it is, there's something unique about you and your position, and you take and use that to serve others. To be a good steward of his grace is not to hang on to that gift and never share it, try to preserve it and keep it alive, but rather to use it to serve others. That's what being a good steward in God's eyes is. So what does it mean with hospitality? Well, this is friendliness to the foreigner. Friendliness to the person who is not from here. And uh, this is a larger term. But the point is that we do this for one another. Each individual person uses whatever God has given them to show this kindness to strangers, kindness to somebody who is out of the fish out of water without grumbling, meaning we are willing to serve somebody else, to bend over backwards, to help somebody who is at a disposition or an imposition rather, um, Without grumbling, we do this cheerfully. Not, you know, like, oh, I'm so tired of having to pick this guy up, you know, <laughs> or uh, having to help him. You know, how long is it going to take him to learn English or whatever? Like, no, do it without grumbling. You know, let's have a good heart, a good attitude, help one another, um, show kindness, show hospitality, and yeah, maybe that does mean open your home to somebody who is visiting, but I think it means more than that. This is a kindness to a foreigner. Somebody who's not from around here, somebody who doesn't fit in, who doesn't know the rules yet, that person should be safe with you. By contrast, when you are at home, if you ever injure yourself um, or you're sick and you sit in front of the TV and you watch the attorneys, those guys, <laughs> 
especially those guys who are appealing to people, um, you know, who are not from this country. Yeah, I'm not so sure that's the kind of love of the foreigner that you want to exhibit. (laughs) You're not on the take. You're not doing this to get ahead or to take advantage of people who do not know better or don't know the law. You are supposed to be a person that they are safe with. You will tell them what is right and what they need to do. What is the law and how to steer clear of evil or wrongdoing in the spirit. So, all right, this is the meaning for the hospitality there. And my point in these illustrations is to talk about earnestness, because he said, love one another earnestly. That covers a multitude of sins. Can anybody love but not earnestly? (laughs) Can anybody serve but then grumble about it later? Complain? Is anybody allowed to serve but only themselves, not others, in the gifts that God has given them? No, you know that's not the intent. The reason for which God gave you these gifts was to share. The reason for which we are called to love earnestly is that that excludes grumbling. It's real love. It's genuine concern, and we're happy to spend and to be spent on behalf of those who are God's children and are in need. Right? That's the meaning. You know that that's the Christian life. That's the moral code to which we are called. Nothing terribly hard about that. Can anybody be something that is not hospitable? No, no Christian is allowed to be less than hospitable. That shouldn't be how you are as any Christian at all. Um, I want to keep moving to the best of my ability. There's a lot more words, but let's see how many we can get through. Able to teach is another one. What does it mean to be able to teach? Well, it occurs here in 1 Timothy 3. It also occurs in 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy, we'll go to define the term. You can see the big picture in the 23rd and the 24th verses of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that those breed quarrels. The Lord's servant, on the contrary, must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. They may come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil after having been captured by him alive to do his will. All right, there's a lot here, but think about it again. It starts with foolish and ignorant controversies. They just lead to quarrel. Don't waste time with that. Instead, you're not quarrelsome as the Lord's servant. You are kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. That means when people mistreat you, which will happen if you are teaching the truth. <laughs> kind, not quarrelsome, but kind, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. That is, they might say bad things about you. Oh, you're just saying this because you're trying to get me, or you're, you're trying to get this thing from me, or you just think you're better than me, or whatever. People say all kinds of horrible things, and they level charges that are false and slanderous. But you keep teaching, because you know they're not really mad at you, They're mad at God. And the fact is, you aren't the one in need. They're the one who's in need. Correcting the opponent with gentleness. Kind to everybody. Patiently enduring mistreatment. Correcting with gentleness. Why do this? Because God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to knowledge of the truth. They may come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil. But right now, they've been taken alive. They're prisoners to do his will. You see their estate. You realize that they are trapped and don't know what they're saying. As Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. If those are your attitude, 
then you are able to teach. That's the meaning. You are able to teach because that's about the worst of what you're going to run into right there. It's easy when everybody is sitting quietly and listening. They've brought their pen and they're taking the notes, you know, and they have their questions. They've read the material ahead of time. Yeah, that's easy. Anybody can do that. <laughs> Try to teach somebody who thinks you're out to get them. Somebody who isn't yet a Christian and thinks that being a Christian is somehow an evil or a bad thing. And yet, isn't every Christian called to do that? You don't think that that's just the work of the evangelist, do you? Only the evangelist teaches the lost? Only the elders teach? No. Is any Christian allowed to enter into foolish controversies that breed quarrels? No. Any Christian allowed to be quarrelsome? To become impatient when falsely accused? To respond to opponents with force instead of gentleness? We're seeing these shocking tapes of people acting this way on school buses and at sporting events, youth sporting events. It's the world. No Christian should ever be caught doing such a thing. God forbid. <coughs> Can any Christian be anything other than able to teach? How is it that you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ with a full conviction that you had to do this to be right with God, to be forgiven of your sins? And yet, somebody asks you, what must I do to be saved? And you can't tell them. Really, you can't tell them how to be saved? How were you saved? Were you saved? I guess. If you don't know how, then I guess you weren't. But what did it take? What did you have to do? Why did you have to do that? Really, you can't tell people how to do that? Hmm. I don't think any Christian is allowed to be less than able to teach. I don't think any of us are allowed to respond to people in the world with anger, to be quarrelsome, to be given to fighting, to hitting people, to raising our voices. I don't, that's not the way that you react. And you know that, don't you? I mean, I think you know that. You know that. That's not Christian at all. That's not loving. That's not kind. Right. Nobody should be like that. Well, as we say, there are so many more. I'll give you one more, and we are going to close up and come back to this. Not a drunkard, 1 Timothy 3.3. 3. I'll give you this one because it's easy. <laughs> the term drunkard does not occur very often. The reason, I think, is because it's obvious. Way back in the Old Testament, this has always been true. Proverbs 23, beginning at 29, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Redness of eyes. It's those who tarry long over wine, who go to try mixed wine. Why? Because in the ancient times, wine was antiseptic, and they typically mixed it with water, okay? So all he's getting at is, you're going to have to spend a lot of time with it to get enough alcohol to get drunk. And so people did that very intentionally. It's not like today's brew. You know, a can of beer today, if you've never had a drink, that's going to knock you over. Now, maybe once you're used to it, you think to yourself, oh, I can take a beer, it won't have any effect. Yeah, maybe. You're lucky you survived that long. Don't look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. Yeah. How much is too much? That much. Don't let it cross your lips. Obvious. It's red. It sparkles in the cup. It goes down smoothly. Yeah, that's the time you don't drink it. Christians are not, children of God, are not allowed to drink intoxicants. In the end, it bites like a serpent, stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things. Your heart utter perverse things. You'll be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, who lies on the top of the mast. 
What does that mean? They all puzzle over it. Well, it's fairly simple. When you're the person who is in the crow's nest, you're supposed to be watching. But you're asleep. They struck me, but I didn't feel it. Uh, yeah, that's what alcohol does. They beat me, but I didn't feel it. When will I awaken? I must have another drink. That's how it is. Best block, no be there. Don't look on it. When it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, stop before you go down that path. You're not guaranteed to stop. Can anybody drink? Can anybody get drunk? Can anybody hang around lingering long at the wine? <sighs> yeah. Do we have to say this? Really? Is anybody allowed to be something other than a, not a drunkard? Any Christian allowed to be a drunkard? No. No. You know what it means. And there are many other such terms. Which, God is willing, we'll get through them. But this is why I'm saying the way that I am and taking the approach that I am. I hope that you find it a useful approach. When we ask, are you elder material? What we mean is, have a look at these. They're not mysteries. You know what they mean. You know what that's like. And you know whether you're doing that or not. And you know whether others around you are doing that or not. It's not a mystery. It's, it's, not, it's not crazy. You should be able to figure this out and should be able to understand it. And I think that's good. It's not like there's this daunting task in front of us where we've got to figure out, well, what does this even mean? I have no idea. No, that's not true at all. It's fairly plain. They're very common. The lists that you read around the New Testament that include these words tend to include the same cluster of words. And it's because it's fairly simple what it means. It's the Christian life. It's being a faithful Christian. A faithful husband in the case of an elder, a faithful father in the case of an elder, yes, but if you're a husband, you have to be faithful. If you're a father, you have to be faithful. It's not a mystery. It's about the Christian life. Okay. Thank you for your kind attention. Are we today, perhaps, speaking with any who have not yet obeyed the gospel? What well, God has shown mercy to allow you time in life that you might consider your soul's estate and might become one of his children. I'm hopeful that in the studies on the elders and on the qualities that are expected of them that you can have a little glimmer of hope that all these are attainable for you. And that's why you would obey the gospel, because there is a promise that tomorrow can be different and better in God, that God can help you to live that life that is pleasing to him. And therefore, you can obtain the blessings that accord with that kind of living and those kinds of choices. All of us are called to it. So why not answer the call of God today? Repent of the past. Start anew as a new person by being buried, putting to death the old person, that you are today, that you might be buried together with Jesus in baptism, that you might be resurrected a new person and start over in life. Completely clean slate, completely clean conscience. Honesty uh, is not the best policy. Honesty is the only way to live. <laughs> you must be completely honest with your God, with whom you have to deal, and with yourself, so that you can be saved so you can be forgiven so you can escape the condemnation that rightly accords with things that are in the past we have water prepared that you might be baptized if today you are already a christian well it's still true that maybe things have not been right well repent pray god for forgiveness the example we've been given in acts 8 but we also will pray with you if that is your need as a christian if today you need to obey the gospel or you need to ask for the prayers of the saints, please let your need in the spirit be known at this time by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected.